Hello everybody, it's Mr. Matthew here again for Honors Biology video 6-2 and this is going to focus in on microevolution and so in this particular video what we're going to talk about is basically the conditions of setting up a gene pool, how that gene pool would stay in equilibrium or not change, and then what happens if certain factors within that gene pool change and how that may end up shifting and leading to small shifts in allele frequency within that population. We'll also do some calculations along with that. So here we go. So what we can see here is a graph over on the far left hand side and when you look at this graph what you'll notice about this graph is that we have a population of island finches um, and these are one of the island populations that we have uh, looking at Darwin's finches on the Galapagos and so when we look at this population what we can see is that it's a pretty stable population at this point where the population is has a peak somewhere around uh, nine millimeters in beak size and a range that um, extends quite a bit it's got a nice bell curve showing this is a polygenic trait now, what are the conditions with which this population would stay at this frequency over time? Well, if this population was to stay the same over time, it would require the same conditions. And these are known as the Hardy-Weinberg conditions. And that is that there's no natural selection. In other words, there is no difference between any of these birds in their ability to survive and reproduce. Also, mating would have to be random. There would be no sexual selection. In other words, uh, there would be no preferential uh, mating based off of uh, size or coloration or bird song or anything along that. Every individual in the population would have to have an equal chance of passing on their genes. The population size would have to be large, um, and ideally the larger the less evolution would take place. We'll talk a little bit about why that is. Uh, here we see that the N is 751. Uh, that's the number of birds that were counted. And it's an interesting question, is this a large enough population for us to be in equilibrium? Um, or with a bird size this small, would we need to go much larger in that case? There can be no new mutations, because again, mutations are the raw materials of evolution, so that means that there is no new uh, alleles coming in. And there also can be no migration. None of the genes within this gene pool can leave uh, through emigration, and no new genes can come in through immigration. And so these are our five criteria in order to maintain Hardy-Weinberg. What that means is that if these five criteria are met, there will be no shift in allele frequency over time. So, well, what, are, what would happen if we saw some of these? So let's talk about a couple of different ways in which we could see a shift in allele frequency, one of the, which is through gene flow. And so gene flow is the transfer of alleles or genes from one population to another. So obviously this is an instance where if we have immigration or emigration and there's genes that flow into or out of the population, that's going to violate Hardy-Weinberg and that's going to lead to shifts in allele frequency. Another term that goes hand in hand with gene flow is the idea of genetic drift. And this is a mechanism of evolution in which the allele frequencies of a population change due to chance. So when you see that word drift, you should think just by chance. And so here what we have is a model where we're using uh, red and green spheres over here to represent our original population. In this original population, you can see we have roughly 50% uh, red and 50% green, or equal distribution of those two in this original population. So now when we look at this, the, at chance we have some of those spheres are selected. And so in the first random selection, we can see up here, we only get two out of these 10 spheres end up being red. And even though the original population was 50-50, because we just randomly drew out by chance um, one sphere or the other blindly, we ended up getting a 80%, 20% uh, population shift. Now, if we were to do this and have these individuals, uh, and this signifies mating and reproducing and having offspring, we would end up seeing that in the next generation it would shift a little bit, and the next generation it would shift a little bit, and based off of the allele frequencies, we may find that the ultimate population leads to 100% red spheres in this population. Now, it's hard to know exactly why these would end up happening this way, 
But what we would end up seeing here is that because we had a chance event or genetic drift leading from our original population to our small population, that ended up leading to a different founding population that we have on this island. Now, I use the word island there because this is often what happens when a population gets separated geographically and moved onto a space like an island. So let's think about what was the first population of birds that left the mainland of South America and ended up on the Galapagos. Now those birds were not voted. It wasn't like all of the birds on South America got together and said, hey, let's vote on the best representatives for our you know species to go out and be on this island. No, it was just a small group of birds that happened to, by chance, go out onto that island. Now, the allele frequencies that were in that small population that went out to that island did not mirror the larger population. So it is a chance event of what allele frequencies we got on this island, and then we have an evolutionary mechanism that takes place in this new environment. So now you can see multiple parts of Hardy-Weinberg at play. First, we have this chance event. We have a small population. Second, we have a gene flow. We have the movements of genes um, out of one population and into another, emigration and immigration. Again, we have this small population, and now we're going to have the selection forces that take place on that island that lead to the new shifts in allele frequency. These shifts in allele frequency are the first steps along the ideas of microevolution and can lead down the line to macroevolution, which we'll get to a little bit later. So let's take a look at the math of Hardy-Weinberg. And so a lot of times what we do is we look over here at this uh, cross, this Punnett square. We're going to cross a heterozygous individual here with this heterozygous individual here. And those two individuals are going to represent a cross of two heterozygotes. And so what are we talking about when we look at these situations? We're looking at that in this original equation, the lowercase p is the frequency of dominant alleles within that population. So in this particular instance, we can see that it is, you know, 50% of the alleles are dominant because we only have two individuals and they are big A, little a. And the q represents the recessive alleles in the population. Again, q in this case is going to be 0.5. It's you know, 50% of our alleles are going to be uh, the recessive, in this case, little a. The phrase p squared represents the homozygous dominant individuals in the population. So if we cross these two individuals, we will see that p squared represents big A, big A. If we look at the q squared, we will see that q squared represents the homozygous recessive. All right. Lastly, the 2pq is going to be equal to are heterozygotes. And so our heterozygotes are here and they are here. Now, I want you to, at this point, pause and think. If I was to give you some information about a trait, so let's say we take a normal Mendelian trait, and in this case, we'll use PTC tasting. And I'm going to ask you the question, and I'm going to say that we have a class and there are 24 individuals in the class, and eight of those 24 cannot take the PTC, and 16 of the 24 can taste the PTC. I want you to tell me, of the things that are in our initial equation, and our initial equation is P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared equals 1, which of those three things do we know, if I know that 8 of my 24 are non-tasters and 16 of my 24 are tasters? And just to remind you that tasting is dominant and not tasting is recessive. So I want you to pause and think, what do I know of this population? All right, so hopefully what you came up with is that when I do a... Uh, comparison of the tasters versus the non-tasters, I know that 8 of my 24, or 0.33 of that grouping, are my Q squared. Now, do I know how many of my 16 out of 24 are homozygous, or my P squared, or how many are 2PQ? The answer is no, I don't know that yet. But if I know Q squared, and that's 0.33, I can then find the square root of that value and then find out what that what p is as a result 
and I can mathematically work through and solve for all of the members of that population. So let's look at an example like that. All right, and so here's what we've got. We have got a population and we're gonna go through, so this is gonna be another pause and think. This is our initial population. And we have our green bugs and our brown bugs. And our initial population, our parental generation, we got a thousand individuals. And within our thousand individuals, we have 360 that are homozygous dominant, 480 that are heterozygous, and 160 that are homozygous recessive. Now, truth be told, if I was gonna give you a problem like this, more likely than not, I would group together that 360 and 480 and just tell you that I had 840 that are showing the green dominant and 160 that are showing the recessive and I wouldn't actually parse this out so I'd make you do a little bit more work. But what I want you to do is I want you to pause and think for a minute and what I'd like you to do is figure out what the first steps you would do. So pause and think. How could you go about figuring out the allele frequencies meaning the P and Q for this population. Pause and think. All right, so hopefully what you did is you went down the line and you figured out, well, if our frequency of each genotype is something along these lines, that half of the 0.48 is going to be 0.24, and that my big A must be uh, the combination of 0.36 plus 0.24, or big A must be 0.6. And same way, you figured out that if 0.24 is the heterozygous contribution of the little a, that 0.24 plus 0.16 is 0.4. And so your P, in this case, is 0.6. So hopefully that was an easy initial first step. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a look at the larger implications here and for this, what we're gonna do is we're going to look at what this looks like when I make a cross. And so we can work out the math here and I can demonstrate. So if I have my P is equal to 0.6 and our Q is equal to 0.4, when I make the cross of these two heterozygotes, what I end up finding is that the P squared is equal to 0.36. Each of those P Qs is 0.24. Again, 0.4 times 0.6 is 0.24 and my Q squared is going to be 0.16. So mathematically, I can actually show this out working my way backwards from the cross to actually demonstrate those genotype frequencies. All right, so here's our last uh, point, and this is another gonna be another pause and think. Over here on the left-hand side of the map, this is showing the area where malaria, the uh, parasite or mosquito-borne parasite Malaria is endemic, meaning where it is found in the wild. And then over on the right are the allele frequencies for sickle cell disease or the sickle cell anemia trait. And so what I can see here is that I've got these pockets where more than 20% of the individuals have sickle cell allele um, and dropping all the way down to less than one, but there's definitely these pockets. And so what I'd like you to do is I would like you to pause and think. And at this time, what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to come up with a correlation between the presence of sickle cell trait and the presence of malaria. So why do you think that the presence of sickle cell trait and the prevalence of malaria are showing the patterns that they are. Come up with some initial hypothesis. Pause and think. All right, so hopefully what you came up with is the idea that um, there must be some selective pressure on individuals in the areas where there's malaria that actually encourages sickle cell disease. Now, you may not have come up with that, and if you didn't, that's fine. But in fact, this is something that we see. We see that individuals in areas where malaria is present, those that have one allele for sickle cell disease, or we call that sickle cell trait, have a uh, protection or natural resistance to malaria. In other words, looking back to our Hardy Weinberg, why would we see a shift in allele frequencies towards that sickle cell trait in this area? We see a strong selection. And in areas where we see almost no alleles, so areas, if we were to look up in this area up here, we don't find any malaria. We also really don't see much in the way of 
um, the sickle cell allele. There's no selective pressure for this, and the presence of the disease actually selects against it. So this is a good example of how allele frequencies can be shifted by the process of natural selection. And it even, in fact, happens in humans, although we obviously don't think about that very often. All right, so hopefully at this point, you've got a pretty good handle on uh, what microevolution is, the shift in allele frequencies. You know the factors that would lead to sh shifts in allele frequencies, or better yet, the factors that would lead to a prevention of a shift in allele frequencies, and those are Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium five criteria. And if you are given a population, you're able to calculate what the allele frequencies are for those dominant and recessive alleles using our Hardy-Weinberg formula. Now, obviously, the Hardy-Weinberg formula is super useful if you know the historical allele frequencies because you can compare before a certain time frame and after a certain time frame, and then you can mathematically demonstrate how alleles have shifted over time. And we're going to see some other examples of those in class, so hopefully this is a good primer to help get you started. All right, I hope this was helpful, and I'll talk to everybody soon.